and I find people who are willing to not think conventionally, who are willing to just for a moment kind of flip a switch and say, what if I were to not ask for a meeting in my outbound emails? What if I were to not ask these questions that tend to trap people? What if I invite people to say no to me in when I'm seeking really a, a yes? Today's guest on the Keynote Curators podcast is Jeff Molander. Jeff is the founder of Communications to Edge, a real innovator and independent thinker in the world of communication. Listen in in today's conversation. You're going to get some great insights on how to be heard in an oversaturated, overcrowded world of communication, whether it's social media, texting, email, voicemail. Jeff has real unique and interesting insights in how to be heard powerfully and how to engage your customers. You're going to be smarter for joining us. So thanks for being here and stick around and learn. So hello and welcome to today's version of Curated Insights with Seth Deckman. Our guest is author, keynote speaker, and communication expert, Jeff Molander. Jeff, thanks for joining us today. Hey, pleasure to be here, sir. Thanks it's for having great me. To ha it's great to have you. I um, want to tell everybody up front, you know, Jeff and I have been working on a professional level. Jeff has been consulting on our communication and how to really expand our capacity to communicate in today's modern digital world. So Jeff, that's kind of the starting point of, you know, the conversation. I've gotten to know your work and you over the course of the pandemic and working with you on my own communication in this digital age during the pandemic, when there's so much more volume of email and Zoom and text and WhatsApp and all sorts of messaging going on. What is probably the, if we have to bottom line it, the key piece that you want to let people know is most important in communicating today? Brevity. You've got to be smartphone short. If you're sending a message to somebody, if you want to be heard, and God knows we all want and need to be heard, and you've got a good quality message and a good product or service or whatever it is, you've got to get it down to that little bite. And that puts a lot of pressure on you, of course, because the consequence of not breaking through in many cases is tremendous. You know, for a salesperson or for a small right. business owner, we've got to eat, right? That's so right. You, you've got to be brief and get to the point immediately. And I guess followed secondly by stop talking about your thing, <laughs> yourself, your service, right. be brief and be focused and be provocative beyond all else. You've got to provoke. That's great. So be brief and provoke, be provocative, but not in an aggressive, antagonistic way, a thought-provoking way, a healthy way. And, you know, what I've learned from you is being thought-provoking instead of pushing, as you said, pushing your service or what your features are, provoking of the interaction, the provoking of the buyer, if you will, the decision maker, whoever it is that you want to get in contact with, is a way to pull them in, in an appealing and attractive and an engaging way. What do you see that people do that is the opposite of that? And then talk about your work that kind of turns that upside down as a little bit counterintuitive. Yeah, most of what we see, and we were all on the receiving end of it, all of us, is push right? Marketing. Everybody's blasting their message out, talking about their thing. But in reality, what we are challenged to do and what many of our customers and our members have a much better success rate at is sparking curiosity. So in other words, pulling. So being brief, being provocative, and as you say, in a positive way, which ends up being curiosity. The only way you're really going to get through today to somebody to get them to listen to you is to start this conversation. And the only way that you're going to be able to start a qualified conversation is to get invited into that conversation. Now, you know, you have permission and you have their curiosity. You've got their active interest. So that message that goes out can't be pushed. It's really got to be more of a, a provocation that helps them come back at you with, well, that sounds interesting. Can you, can you tell me more? Or uh, I've never heard anybody say it that way before. What are you getting at? So that's the kind of 
provocation that I'm trying to describe here. Right. And it sounds like the push is informing, you're talking at, a lot of describing, a lot of explaining, and the pulling, the invitation is maybe inquiring, asking a question. Um, is, that, is that accurate? Yeah, absolutely. It's, but however, as you well know, it's that type of question. So if we ask, if we, I like these emails that I get, are you taking any more uh, leads, Jeff? Do you need any more business? I mean, these are obvious ploys. They're marketing hooks. They're just a question designed to elicit an answer from me that makes me the victim of a sales pitch, right? Right. So it's like somebody is altruistically out there indiscriminately or not indiscriminately, but doing a little bit of research, choosing you and saying, hey, I got all these leads. Do you want them? Right. So it's it's, it's an obvious. There's only one way for me to answer that question. And I'm not going to answer that question because I know it's a trap for a sales pitch. But what I'm open to answering is a really, as you said, a really smart question, which might be a question that I should be asking myself, but am not at the moment. Those are the kind of questions that make you stop as you're going through your smartphone and you're like, you know, okay, sales guy, sales guy, saleswoman, saleswoman, delete, delete, asking these questions that are making me a victim. I'm not a victim. I see it. No, thanks. Oh, what's that? Well, that's a really good question. Yeah, I should probably be asking myself that question. And that question tends to stop people and reflect on their own status quo situation. And it's that reflecting on their own status quo situation that kind of opens them up because it's not a trap, right? It's right. just somebody who's asking a smart question. Right. So what comes next, of course, is an opportunity to actually engage in a conversation. But that's that moment where you have a chance at sparking their curiosity with a really good question. What would be an example of some work that you've done without disclosing any, you know, clients or names or anything of a question where somebody you were working with that you were doing your training with that was what we'll call the old paradigm, describing, explaining, pushing. They took your coaching, they, they implemented the training and flipped it on its head and started inquiring and posing smart, thoughtful, provoking healthy, provoking questions. What's an example or even two, if you have any of those? Somebody who might be selling a financial advisor, selling, I'm working right now with a gentleman who's selling uh, high quality, really high quality advice to people who need it. In, and he's, his service area is Manhattan, which is a really prosperous, but also very challenged at the, at the moment sure. uh, area with people who need advice and financial advice. So you know, he, he has been asking all these what I call hook questions that tend to repel, that tend to push away people because, right. you know, they've they've heard these questions before. Right. And, but at the, but what we're trying to do is is work on developing questions that are more open ended and that would allow the prospect, uh, the potential uh, customer to reflect on their own one element of their own uh, financial challenge. Right sure. to get them just to think about their kid's college fund for a minute, but not in a way that entraps them to into a, a conversation about a, a business relationship, but more of a problem solving type of question. So it's a, it's a question, it's an inquiry, it's something that's related to them. And then what's next? You you get instead of um, getting repelled, you get some traction. People interact. And then where do you take it from there? Do you continue the inquiry or is there some point where it can turn where you can begin to go back to the old paradigm or do you recommend continuing all the way through with the new, the new model? It really depends on the skill that the salesperson has at the moment, but it, because there's a lot of intuition involved. But what we're finding is that even when the customer might say, Sure, hit me with it, Seth, right? Tell me what it would be like to have a business relationship with you. Many times what, you know, our temptation is to launch into the pitch, which is sure. primarily about us. Yeah. What we're right. finding, though, is that by breaking the rules a little bit and, and not thinking conventionally and just come, coming back at the customer and say, I'm happy to answer your question. I'm happy to talk about myself. But do you mind if I ask you another question about you to make sure that my answer and the context that I'm speaking in actually matters to you? Sure. So, so kind of slowing down. So brevity, spark curiosity to begin with. And then once you got that conversation going, even when you get 
someone who sounds like they're a fish on the hook, right? They're like, okay, right. I'm, I'm ready for it. Hit me with it. Tell me right. all the details about what a business relationship would be like to actually slow down a little bit and come back at them and say, look, I want to talk a little bit more about you before I talk about me. Is that okay? We're finding right. that that tends to open up the conversation much and, and advance the good conversations that are worthy of advancing faster. And the other right. ones fall away. The people it who are like you're also, that. It sounds like, Jeff, you're also recommending at that stage to come in and, and request permission. I mean, not formally, but do you mind? Is it okay if I ask if I, you know, if you could tell me this about you or your situation? Is that part of the, you know, the new paradigm, the new model here, breaking the rules a little bit? Well, certainly, but but without risking, if I understand your question correctly, without risking looking needy, you know, right. that's the that's the challenge right. with and that's maintaining your 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 level of expertise and your status. We see this a lot that if you have something to sell. If you're like this gentleman, Kevin, he is at the top of his game. He's been doing, he's been a financial advisor in New York city for 20 years. Okay. So he knows his stuff, but yet at the same time, we find ourselves making these presentations digitally and he can write very well. Right. But you know, he's asking for permission at the wrong times and he's, you know, thanking too quickly. You know, if you're that good, your client should be thanking you. Right? right. Especially if you're providing right. financial advice that, right. that turns the person's life around with their kids, their family, right. what have you. You're so not maintaining that status is key. Right. You're not saying don't be appreciative, don't be grateful, but the abuse, if you will, of it can lower your status or lower their view of your expertise, which then has a, has a negative repelling effect on communication. Right. I mean, overthinking or at the end of your your message to them at delivering the proposal, I look forward to your response. Just think about not including that. And what we're finding is that in many cases that strengthens the tone of the writing and you look a lot less needy, right? You want the business, obviously you're courting this business, but you don't want to overuse certain words that put you at risk of looking desperate. For the business. Right. What about, I get a lot from people who are like, please confirm receipt of this email. Is that, uh, more, that, that where does that fall in? That, that sounds occurring a little bit needy. Uh, please confirm receipt of the email. Yeah. I mean, it depends on, it depends on where you are in the conversation. I would sure, suppose. Sure. But yeah, it could, it could be perceived as being very or needy. I mean, in if the it's, world of if brevity, you, Right. In the world of brevity, and maybe, you know, if you've already had a like some established interaction at some point, confirm receipt might be something that is uh, a little bit more direct, brief, and, you know, keeps the status, right? It doesn't lower the status, if you will. Or are you referring to, it sounds like you're referring to kind of a follow up situation where exactly. you want to show yes. somebody. Okay. Yes. Sure. Right. I mean, most people tend to go on and on. It's so two or three paragraphs of basically, yeah. Did you receive it? You know, one phrase that I've been using and our members have been using very effectively lately is how do you react to what I shared? Right. Just ah, that. So right. How do you react to what I shared? Is it Nothing how else. do you or how did you? Or oh, how do you react? Uh, present tense. Okay. Right. How do you react to what I shared? Got it. And, that and kind you, of a, a provocation as opposed you, to, hey, I'm here, I'm following up again. And, uh, you know, I sent this on this day and it's usually what people, you know, tend to go on and on. Right. One of the ones that's worked really well for me is I have good traction. I've used your counterintuitive breaking the rules and I've done some inquiry and some provocation and got some engagement. And then I get crickets. And, you know, I begin to fall back into the old model. Oh, you know, I'm following up, I'm following up. And what I've learned is I use one simple phrase and none of this is a magic bullet, right, Jeff? I mean, it all depends on each situation is unique, but I've used, did you see this email? Like I'll send it as a forward back to them and not, did you read it? Not, did you receive it? Did you see it? And I'm telling you, people respond to that. <laughs> yes, my my boss just left and we don't have a replacement and the office is turned upside down or, oh, we had an unexpected emergency at home and I had to be out of the office for 10 days. And, you know, people respond to it. It's just been incredibly useful um, for me. Jeff, I want to I switch gears a little bit, but 
just a little bit, but related to this breaking the rules and going counterintuitive. And one of the things that really appealed to me when we first started working together, which was super counterintuitive, getting to the no, get the no, look for the no, find the no, want the no. And I said to myself, Embrace the no. right. what's that? Re- Embrace what's the no. That? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Embrace the no. And I'm saying to myself, I'm a lifelong salesman. I'm saying to myself, get the yes, get to yes. How to get the yes. Where is the, the yes is that way. I'm going that way. Oh no, wait, it moved. It's over there. Let me go over there. And I start working with Jeff Molander, keynote speaker, author, expert communication trainer. And he says to me, Seth, get them to know. And I said, you got to explain this to me. So tell me what you mean by that. Sure. Well, as you said, everybody is seeking the yes so that they can take the next step and earn the conversation or what have you. So it is a little bit counterintuitive to ask somebody, are you opposed to taking the next step? Well, no, I'm not opposed to it, but, you know, so this kind of a, a request as opposed to, what do you say we take the next step, right? It's a completely different energy. Maybe you've read it correctly and it is time to use that phrase. What do you say? Let's take the next step. That, that's a wonderful way to do it, to ask for the sale. But oftentimes we're met with, you know, <laughs> talk to the hand. Sure. Uh, or, or silence. Or what I learned was, is that the example you just gave is, it's another opportunity for them to punt push you away and not define that they're really either not ready, they've changed their thoughts on what they're doing, and they're just not saying it. Right. So you use the word, one of the phrases just there, are you opposed? Talk about the importance of that kind of inquiry, that kind of questioning related to getting to the no. Sure. I mean, are you opposed to this is a great way to get them to flex their power, right? Right. Mm, You know, you're recognizing my power that, yeah, I might be opposed to this, that no is a potential response. And this allows them to flex some of their muscle, flex some of their authority, you know, which they like to do. And at the same time, it's kind of a, a liberating feeling where they can, as you said, well, no, I'm not opposed to it, but let me tell you what, what my challenges are. I can't make this decision without the other four people involved, or I got to go get the money to make that decision, or right. I got to talk to my wife to make that decision or my husband, whatever it is. So asking for a negative response is, is often unexpected as well, and it can be provocative, but also very liberating to get at what the root cause of not going forward might be. Right. Because if you get the no, then it's cut bait and move to a different fishing hole. No more time, energy, or resources put into that. Maybe revisit it down the road. But it seems like that type of question empowers them and gives them permission to say no, and both parties can move on rather than have this kind of inauthentic dance back and forth of like, kind of, not really, not there, maybe we're waiting. And on one side of the coin, the salesperson is, you know, becomes more and more desperate, and more and more hopeful. Whereas you're recommending breaking the rules and giving them the opportunity to say no. If it's not a hard no, the question in the form that you teach is a way for them to open up and give you a little bit more texture about their situation. And then you've deepened an understanding of them and you've deepened the relationship. And and I can tell you from personal experience, it's been really, really helpful. Um, Yeah. I mean, so there's two no's there, I guess. One is, as you started off with, you want to get to the no so you can disqualify the bad conversations that aren't never going to go anywhere. So you're not clinging to them. Right. But you also have the ability to use requesting the no as um, as a as a tool that you can use to to earn the no but earn no's that come along that r- with information that rides along with that no that you can use uh, because it might be a soft no it might be a hard no as you you've been describing them yeah. sure and it could be a no that truly is a no not right now but could be a yes down the road and you, you would never know that I think honestly, without inquiring in the coming from embrace the no, you know, it's, it's, it's been interesting for me. I still notice the old habits coming in and, um, well, it's hard not to, because we're excited We're you know, we get a lead, you got a client, you got another client, you got three clients or, you know, whatever, maybe a big client and you know, you need the money. (laughs) 
Right. We, we, we right. all need the money, right? So we all, it's, we all need- it's natural because we're, right. we're in business to because it's exciting, right? So we're on yeah. the front lines. and Right. Uh, and when you're close to the goal line, you've got a real opportunity. You perhaps put a proposal forth and you, you spec something. You've got the specs and, and you've brought the ball down the field a good distance and you want to keep it to, to get the score. It's counterintuitive to embrace the no at that point. You want to keep getting the momentum on a linear way, but that's just the moment where a little disruption, a little bit of you know counterintuitive, a little bit of breaking the rules is what's required today. Let's move into a little bit deeper. We've covered being brief. And I notice even for me as the writer of emails and leaving voicemails, being brief has been a relief. It's been alleviating. But, you know, Jeff, communication, everybody's communicating. There's WhatsApp, there's Instagram, there's emails. We don't really have faxes anymore. The cell phone, people are leaving audios. There's Twitter, LinkedIn messaging, Facebook. I mean, you name it, Slack, Telegram, you know, communication. We're communicating. I'm going to send them an email. I'm going to leave a message. Did they get back to me? I didn't get back to them. Did you get back to me? I'm waiting on their message. But there's so much of that, but nobody's really saying anything. Nobody's really saying anything. And I don't know if you agree with me, but in that storm of messaging, it's so much harder to get attention. And especially in the social world. I'd like you to share with our viewers your work with social selling and getting people's attention and how you invite, you know, continuing on this conversation. How do we how do we get attention in social selling here? The only way you're going to break through all this noise is by performing what is called a pattern disrupt. If you look at your your phone or your mobile or your, you know, whatever your, you see patterns. Our, our whole life, we see all these patterns. And when it comes to digital media, people have become very good at identifying unwanted crap on their Facebook or on their email, whatever, and just, and just getting rid of it. It's like, uh, I was talking to one guy the other day and he said, well, you know, I was with a, a potential client and I was having lunch. And as we were eating our salads, he had his phone out and he, we were, he was making eye contact with me. He was deleting all this unwanted spam from salespeople. And he was eating his at sell that we're having lunch, all three things at the same time. It's that easy. So in order to break through and for this guy eating his salad, having a conversation to stop and, and be startled for a moment, you've got to not do what everybody else is doing. You've got to stop conditioning people And that's what I see a lot of is people falling into these very typical patterns that make them easily deleted. Ah, so how how do you get the attention to be the non-deleted one? How do you, you know, one of your clients that you're you're working with in, in your communication work is having lunch with a prospect or a potential business. This person is eating their salad, making eye contact with the person you're working with. And they're deleting all their unwanted emails. How do we become the one that is not deleted? By breaking the pattern. So, I mean, I know it's a ridiculously short, trite answer. We were talking earlier about asking a question in a way that isn't a marketing hook, that isn't clear to the person who's receiving it. Oh, if I read the end of that, if I read this full question and I answer it, I'm going to get trapped, right? Someone is looking for me to say yes or no so that they can sell to me as opposed to breaking the pattern and asking the question that has absolutely no bias from the seller. Mm. So in other words, it's a question that I should be asking myself maybe, but I'm not asking myself. But it's a worthwhile question to ask myself if I'm interested in a specific outcome or improvement in my life. So that's the kind of jarring, wait a minute, why is this person asking this question? That's a really good question. I I don't know if I have the answer to that. Do you have the answer to that question? What is So you're provoked. You're kind of curious. You might even realize that this is someone who might eventually try to sell you something. But at the moment, they're not asking for a meeting. At the moment, they're not asking you right. you know, a question that insults your intelligence that makes you go, right. no, I'm not going to answer that because that's a trap. And right. I, I don't do traps. Thank you very much. So that's the pattern disrupt that I'm getting at. And there's um, half a dozen ways to, to go about doing that. That's perfect. That was really, that was a really good, I think we got a clip right there. That was really great because, you know, Jeff, what you're talking about requires 
thinking. It requires slowing down. And if I receive something that is provoking in a healthy way, that makes me stop and think, wow, I didn't consider that. Or, hmm, I need to inquire about that. It demonstrates that whoever sent it has taken the time to, at the level that they're able to, get into your world enough Right. to have a question that's been provoking and thus that's the way to get their attention and you know it's been an eye opener for me um again going against my trained dna of being brief being counterintuitive breaking the rules a little bit but i have gotten responses and um you know i just think that anybody out there who is interested in breakthroughs in communication breakthroughs in using digital communication for their business i'm telling you edge communications jeff molander keynote speaker author and communication expert you got to get on the phone get on a zoom call get connected with jeff because he's a master at it so uh, just a couple more things here and then i think we can kind of round it out so jeff as you know, I deal with meeting planners, event planners, conference planners all day, every day. And they're constantly approached by all different types of services and people that want to earn their business. And you being a speaker have also been involved in that ecosystem of competing for attention for a meeting planner or an event planner or a conference planner. What have you learned from your keynote speaking and interactions within that world that would be really helpful for those that are constantly being seeked out, but need a way to govern or administrate, you know, that constant interruption, but at the same time, pay attention to what's important. Wow. That's really hard. I mean, set up filters in your, in your inbox and um, in your email client and, sure. you know, so that you have a, the ability to have a clean, relatively clean inbox where you can, I guess, find the unwanted emails quite easily, right. but your, right. your good emails go into the right folders, right? Right. Well, let me ask it this way. As much as people are seeking attention because I'm offering my service or my product or both, and Edge Communications and Jeff Molander are bringing in what I'm calling the new paradigm of communication, where you're provoking, it's counterintuitive, you're breaking the rules, and it's been successful. The other side of the coin, Jeff, being brief, if I'm a conference planner and I'm completely being bombarded all the time, food and beverage vendors, hoteliers, airlines, ground transportation, all that kind of stuff, what type of communication tools or methods can I be using to keep them at bay from the other side of the coin? Does my, communi does my question communicate? Um, yeah, I don't think I've ever, I would have to think about that some more. Okay. I don't okay. know that I, cause I'm thinking here, here's what I'm thinking. Maybe you can kind of riff off of it. I'm thinking that equal parts brief because often their time gets sucked in by themselves because they're not saying no, they're not being brief. They're not getting to the point. You know, I don't think that the answer is writing back to a vendor that's looking on their business. Why should I work with you? I don't think that that's a provocative well, way to I mean, do it. At some point, at some point, they 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 train themselves. That that this gets back to the guy who's eating the salad. He's so good at it. So I think you know, Pat, recognize the patterns. Right. right? There are the, all this all these messages that are coming at you, seeking new relationships as opposed to current vendors who have, are trying to get you the artwork for whatever it is. Right. right. So you know, recognize the patterns from these people who are who do not have an established relationship with you and that's going to make it a lot easier there, there's certain patterns of of message behavior that they'll demonstrate that should make it easier for you okay that I don't that, know if that, that helps that, but no that 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 is helpful what is it that you're working on right now that's most exciting you working with Seth this guy Seth do you know him <laughs> Seth Deckman. Okay. That was a given. I'm sorry. That, I should have known that. Apart from working with me, what is it that, what, what's exciting you right now? Well, what's exciting is the level of intensity globally in terms of sales outreach. It's just going through the roof. There are more people these days trying to use digital to get in touch with people and failing, failing miserable. So, 
I get excited when I wake up in the morning and I find people who are willing to not think conventionally, who are willing to just for a moment kind of flip a switch and say, what if I were to not ask for a meeting in my outbound emails? What if I were to not ask these questions that tend to trap people? What if I invite people to say no to me in when I'm seeking really a, a yes? And so that's what's exciting to me is there are people who are usually reaching this pain threshold of not having enough success, but who are willing to get out of the box and actually try something new. I mean, we live on a planet where people are just, you know, it's really hard to to break out of our established behavioral patterns. Like for right. me, I like to preface when I write, but it's horrible. You know, when you're sending an email, you should never preface the statement. This takes more time. It weakens your, your message overall. It's just a bad habit. And bad habits are hard to break, whether it's smoking or drinking or the way that you write. Right. And, you know, I think, Jeff, people are hungry for something new and a better, more effective way. I think people are really hungry for it. And what I found is when I'm brief with people, they're hungry for that, too. They're starving. I try to explain. That's very well said. I try to explain that whenever I can. People are starving for brevity. They're starving to have their curiosity provoked. What they are experiencing every day is push, 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 push. Messages just coming at them, flooding them from every direction. And it's just not working, obviously. So they're starving for someone to just say something differently to them, be really brief and provoke their curiosity. And absolutely, you nailed it. If you'd like to learn more about this speaker, visit our website at thekeynotecurators.com. There you'll find dozens of videos of speakers that are a perfect fit for your event. If you'd like to reach out directly, please click on the link below in the description. My name is Seth Deckman, and you've been watching Curated Insights.